Yeah. So for anyone that doesn't know you, Leanne, tell us a little about yourself, how you got into the industry and where you are now. Hey, everyone listening. So I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for having me, by the way. No problem. Um, a little bit about me. So before I was a transformation coach or a transformational coach specialist, whatever you want to call us, um, I basically take the ordinary looking person and turn them into the, the, the kind of the god of their dreams, the person of their dreams, the biggest aspiration of fitness goals. Um, before I did that, I was actually a musical theatre performer. So from the age of two into well into my 30s, I danced, sang and acted my whole life. Um, loved it. It was my dream. It was my passion. But I also had a passion for fitness alongside it. The, the two kind of work very much hand in hand with it being a physical, physical job. And then unfortunately, when I, I was 35, I believe, I had an injury that just changed my life. So that injury kind of flipped my world upside down. And um, yeah, led me to kind of where I am now. It was one of those moments of where um, I kind of felt vulnerable for the first time. My body had always bounced back. I, at this point, I was already a personal trainer alongside performing, um, but my body just wasn't bouncing back, wasn't responding. And so from there, I kind of dove into the world of aesthetics and transformational skills, also because I wanted to selfishly in the beginning rehab my own body I wanted to be able to get strong again I wanted to be able to move again but in a different way I knew I wasn't going to be able to perform again and then that led me to kind of where I am today so that I kind of made my way through through the fitness industry until I ended up as a coach as I am now. So I'm, I'm assuming that the injury is what made you decide between going down the performing arts route like many of the people that are now your clients and friends and go down sort of like the fitness route. I mean, do you mind me asking what happened that made that such a big shift in your life? Yeah, so I was on stage actually in a musical called Priscilla, Queen of the Desert. And dancers have injuries. It's just very, very normal to have an injury um, and to bounce back in the same way athletes do. Dancers and athletes are the same. We are, we are athletes. So you're very used to pushing through, ignoring pain um, and kind of just getting on with it. like the quote, the show must go on is real. Like that is how every performer feels about that show that has to happen that night. So there was already a few aches and pains going on in the body um, that I kind of was ignoring really. A um, little bit of muscle soreness, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And then that one night and you couldn't have even foreseen it. I was on stage and I was finishing a number and about to exit the stage. And as I turned, I tore um, the medial head of my gastroc, which is obviously my calf for people that don't know what that is. And it was a stage three tear. So it was pretty bad. Um, my calf was like hanging on by a thread, but at the same time, because of the way I moved and I tore my left calf, I then herniated my L4, the disc on the right side of my back and my L5 S1. So I managed to throw myself off stage because it was dangerous and there was moving parts and this, the stage was literally disappearing. We have a pit that was going to move down. I got off stage and I thought I was going to be fine. I was like, no, 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 I'll be fine. I'll just walk it off. And then I couldn't walk it off. Um, I couldn't walk. And then I had chronic sciatica down both legs and I basically was sent home for treatment. But then as I was being treated and given diagnosis of what I'd done and how severe it was because the herniations were really bad, um, they were basically like, you've got a crossroads, like you're not going to be able to perform like you did again. The calf will heal, but the back may never heal. We, we can try loads of therapies. Um, so whether that be nerve root blocks, whether that be facet joint injections, whether that be having an operation um, to actually like shave part of the disc off to take the pressure off the sciatic nerve. And so it's been, what, three or four years now of just constant treatment, constant therapy. And I said to my doctors, I want to see if I can get strong first. I don't want to have any kind of operations if I can get strong and rehab it, like rehab my body around it and make myself as strong as possible um, around this injury. So I still have this injury. I still have a herniated L4. I still have a herniated L5S1. I have sciatica still down both sides. Yeah, I still train. I still deadlift. Um, all of the things that people say you can't do because I've just built my body up to being the strongest it can be around that injury. So probably I would be in worse pain if I wasn't as strong as I am. Um, I think it's really important to rehab an injury um, and that kind of is what sent me down like the rabbit hole of all of this and how obviously I met you and everybody else in the industry that I've kind of come to meet since and um, I'm a big believer in I'm a big believer in if you put the time in it, it may still mean I need surgery in the future but if I do I'm in a better position 
Um, I also can then be sympathetic to people in, in my situation because herniated discs in your back is very common. Um, and people seem to think it's the end of everything. And it was the end of one part of my life, but then it opened up a whole new chapter of my life as well. I think it's interesting, like, we'll go into sort of like into that in a second before we go into your rehab. But it, you, you hit the nail head with about how disc herniations are so common. I think if people realise how common they were, there'd be much less fear around them. Like, having a herniated disc and then having a pain associated with a herniated disc are very different. Like, if so many people are walking around with them, they're not necessarily debilitating at all but obviously the severity of, of yours alongside the injury it probably meant that you you changed the way you walk to change the way you move to compensate with probably then put more pressure on and these things you know go around the way but it, it's it's a it's, it's it's not something that you can't sort of rehab around but before we go into the rehab like talk to you a little about that like the identity shift going from look, I don't know too many people in that world but I know enough to know that it becomes their life. Everything is about being a dancer, an actor, a performer. Um, you know, like, how was that when you, when you got that news of that injury? Like, like, how was that like, how did you feel with that? I was in denial in the beginning. Um, my initial reaction was, you're not gonna tell me I can't perform, perform anymore. I've done this my whole life. I've beat worse injuries than this. Like you go into that kind of realm of, no, you just watch me. I'll get back. I'll be able to do it. And then I started obviously on trying to rehabilitate my back and stuff. Um, and remembering that this is something I'd done since I was two. So it wasn't just the thing I loved. It wasn't just my passion. It was part of me. And a lot of performers are in a similar boat. We start it from such an early age that it becomes part of our identity. We don't really know anything else in the same way as I guess athletes that are training for a big event for such a long time, it's your life. My whole life revolved around it. I canceled weddings. I can't, you know, going to weddings, I canceled holidays. I missed out on things in my youth because everything that made performing worth it came first. Um, I'd be away for long periods of time and miss things with my family. And it didn't matter because I, I loved it and they knew I loved it. And that's where I felt the most whole. But once I kind of started down the journey of trying to rehabilitate my injuries, as I've done a million times, to get back onto stage, I very quickly realized that this injury actually was probably the one that wasn't going to let me. And so I, I kind of spiraled a little bit. I went through this kind of um, mourning. But I started off in denial. Then I kind of mourned it because I didn't really know who I was without singing and dancing in my life. My entire friendship group revolved around it. Um, apart from the close friends I have from primary school, like everybody else I knew was an actor and an actress. It was my whole life. So all of a sudden I was like, oh, hang on a minute. Like, I don't know anything outside of this. Um, yes, I've done other things. I've dabbled in other areas because actors are resilient. Hence why I was already a personal trainer. You have to still make a living alongside acting normally. We're not always in a job. But yeah, um, to be honest, if I was really honest, the initial thing that happened was me kind of getting quite depressed about it in comfort eating. I piled on a terrible amount of weight and I'm not ashamed to say it, I did it like we've all been there like I because obviously my body had, had always been something that I had to look after so much to perform because you, you are your product and so I was comfy eating which obviously then made the injury worse I was you know feeling a bit depressed and not wanting to move and feeling like I'd let myself down or I'd failed or that my body had let me down so I was mad at myself I was angry at my own body and then, so I kind of had to pull myself out of that and being like, okay, right. You've made a decision. Like the performing probably isn't going to happen anymore. There is nobody saying you can or you can't. They just advise that you don't. So if you were to make a choice, what is it you want for your life? I want to be happy. I want to be healthy. I want to be able to move without pain. Um, I want to help as many people as possible. And so I started to list all of these things that I, I wanted that were to not, weren't anything to do with performing. They were just what I wanted for me. And then all of a sudden I, I realized that I was like, well, actually this, what I'm going through right now could actually possibly help other people in the future. Maybe this is a new path I can navigate it down. Like what is my rock bottom then can become, you know, something else that then is, you know, turned into a positive on the other, like the other flip side. So it took me a good six months and then, I kind of then transitioned, got my first job in aesthetics, 
um because I, I wanted to work along, alongside the best people in the industry because I was like if I'm going to work I want to work you know surrounded by people that love this that I can learn from that I feel like I'm surrounded by everybody who was a mentor so that is what I did and I, I learned fast and I got stuck in and I found like this new love and this new passion that I didn't realize was there that then kind of made it okay that that's not what I did anymore and that's not what my identity was it's still a massive part of me and it's still very much as part of my life performing um as we'll probably talk about later but yeah I've, I found that like the want to help people the want to give back the want to make people not suffer in the way that I had and all the other things that had kind of come along with performing which I can dive into in a bit morph yeah morphed into what is this career now it was it was it was strange it was a, it was it was a very very much like a a metamorphosis of like me transitioning through and kind of spiraling out and finding out who I was and coming out the other side being like I'm okay this is okay like I can do I this I can I can totally I can totally like relate and empathize right because I was that it's like coming out of a long-term breakup isn't it really where you know you're so much of your life is in that sort of situation that like you have to give yourself a true hard look of like like who actually am I when you take this part out and I I had it when I when I when I got injured and had to stop rugby. I wasn't probably at the level you were in equivalent of dancing. I had a similar thing when when I when I left uh, you know, my last place of work. You know that was seven years of my life, and a lot of my identity, a lot of my social media presence was known as that guy that worked for that place. And then it was like, well, who am I when you take off the ultimate performance T-shirt? Like, and and then like that's you know in the same way, it's like you have to sort of reanalyze yourself. But I think often that's where people where people do their most growth is when they have to truly take the hard look and like hit a wall and sort of like go from there. Like I, you know, I know every success story I've had, every podcast I've had up to this point has a similar story of something went wrong that led to this. And every big yeah. leap in my life was something went wrong that led to this. And it's all these things are often a blessing in disguise. Yeah, they're catalyst moments, aren't they? The mo in that moment, you can't see them. You feel like you're whirling and you're spiraling and that the walls are closing in. But once you come out the other side of it and then reflect back at how far you're you've come, you're like, oh man, like all the lessons that I learned in that moment, all the growth I made personally in that moment, um, you actually are then proud of where you've come from. And I think like anybody going through those moments at the moment where they feel like, you know they're stuck or the walls are closing in or that they're, they're hitting a crossroads just know that like it will pass and when you pass through the other side and reflect back you'll have made all the right decisions because you'll have gone instinctively you'd have gone with your gut and then just kind of progressed forwards into what was right for you in that moment yeah and i think it's, it's well a lot of these things it's like if you if you look back if you got the opportunity now to take it back and go back to like where you were a lot of times people wouldn't want that anyway like i know I know like using the relationship example, because most people, this is probably the closest way they can relate to something like this. It's like, you loved that person at the time, but would you go back there now if you had the chance to and make it right? I certainly wouldn't. And in the same, like you, you learn from sort of like those moments. Now, I, I, was on my, I was really listening to the podcast I did with Simon Miller recently. He was saying like, if you'd asked The Rock, if you could go back and actually get into the NFL at the time when he was turned down, would he take it? Of course he wouldn't, because this led him to, for wrestling than into being the biggest star in Hollywood. So like for yourself, if now having done what you would have done, and you can say, yes, of course I would, would you still have gone down the route before if you could, if you knew what you, the way your life would have taken you and you were there before the injury and let's say, you know, you could choose it for it not to happen in some way, which way would you have gone? I don't know, um, probably not. I don't think I would go back because when I look, then I start to reflect back at how I was whilst performing and kind of what kind of happened and some of the things I've learned that now I apply within my business. Um, and I just said a moment ago about, you know, the lessons I've learned and coming out, I utilize them to their fullest. So that dark time post injury, um, the comfort eating and that snowballing. I look back at actually performing and I love it dearly and I, I'll always love it but I was in quite an abusive relationship with it so I lived for the I lived for the show that hired the show but then you know the downsides were really down like we you know you're strapped for cash you struggle and it's it's a tough life pairing that along with constantly being judged 
by your external factor, not just your talent all the time. So I struggled with eating or disordered issues. I did have an eating disorder for a long time. Um, so actually you start to look at all the things that I put myself through for an industry that I loved. Um, it took me a very long time to get over anorexia, which went, led me through various bouts of bulimia into disordered eating, which then if anybody that's ever su suffered with any kind of disordered eating pattern or eating disorder, it can come back at any time. Um, even if you think it's done, and even if you think you, you're past it. So for example, when I spiraled, um, when I was really sad about leaving the industry, all of a sudden one side of the bulimia came back, which was the binging, which was the disordered eating, the BED. And all of a sudden I was faced with that again. And I was just like, oh man, like none of this would have even happened if I wasn't performing. Like, so again, which also then led me towards aesthetics. I was like, I want to help people like take care of their bodies. I don't want, you know, especially performers. I want to get rid of the stigma of crash dieting and people under eating in, in the performance world. Um, because it happens a lot as dancers and musical theater performers and actors and actresses. I want, you know, I want people to be sensibly eating, fueling their bodies for power. You know, if I can help one person that, you know, suffers with an eating disorder, get help or send them down the right path or just give them someone to talk to, like, that's a big thing for me. It's a big win. It's why probably I'm compassionate and empathetic to my clients and why my clients get the results they do, because I think I've lived a lot of the facets that, that they're about to go through. And I wouldn't have done that if I hadn't gone through my entire journey and come out the other side. And it just makes me a better coach. So, no, I don't think I would. I wouldn't go back, I don't think. So I, I, I think there's, there's a lot of things to unpack that I was like, you know, mega, mega interesting. And it's, it's, it's I, I like to say that you, you're trying to get people to fuel them for performance, and especially when you're looking at dancers, because it'd be, it'd be interesting to know, you can always say whatever, right? But it'd be interesting to know that if, if you'd uh, have that relationship with food that you do now, then would you have been resilient enough to not have that injury in the first place? Like, not I absolutely food. believe if I hadn't been so mean to my body when it came to my relationship with food, I wouldn't have got that injury. I absolutely believe it was just my body in the end at 35 saying enough, yeah, enough now. Like, do you think it's different? Do you think it's different? Like, I, I was interested in the performance arts world. It's like, do you think there's a difference in the way with actors and with dancers? In, and the only way, like, I, I, in terms of maybe relation to food um, and just the mental side of it, because in a way, like, obviously there's this, there's, there's, you know, there's amazing dancers are absolutely incredible. But when you look at people who, who make a lot of money through dancing, you're looking at, you know, things like shows like, you know, the Lion King or performance shows, or you're looking at back and backup dancers for performance. And a lot mm -hmm. of the dancers, you work so hard to be probably some of the most skillful human beings on the face of this earth to do a job where you're, if you're good at it, background, even yeah. though, you're unreal and probably better than the person you're being background to, as opposed to an actor where they, they, they do this work, whether it's physique work or practice and lines, whatever the skill they need to learn, and they get the plaudits, they get the time to shine. Do you feel that, good for good or worse, because it can go both ways, do you feel that the mental side of it is very different with an actor as opposed to a dancer? In some degrees, yeah, I think, they both love their craft. It's about the craft and, you know, an actor expresses through his scene work, through bringing lines off a page and bringing them to life. Whereas a dancer expresses with their body. So it's the same thing. They'll take the lines off the page and express it to music. Um, it just is one of those things, unfortunately, that dancers aren't paid as much. Um, dancers are a dime a dozen and that one gifted actor is not. Um, the skill level is the same. It's just the want and the need for that type of art. Um, the difference when it comes to getting them ready, I mean, with kind of like conditioning a dancer, you're conditioning them for that particular sport. In So you, you have to bear in mind how hyperextended they need to be, how their flexibility, you know, is created, how their movement patterns are created. So training them around that to make sure that you, you know, you're not hindering any of that is really important. Where, you know, as an actor, you don't really have to worry about that so much. The only time you do have to worry about it is if it's an actor that sings, because obviously heavy lifting can affect their larynx and can tighten up their throat. So you have to make sure that all of that is good, um, especially as your traps get tight and all of that 
all of that kind of detail that happens around the shoulder area whilst you're you're training. We incorporate a lot um, of breath work for, for that kind of stuff, so with with actors, like a lot of diaphragmatic work. Yeah, so same for same for same for dancers. So dancers tend to breathe more like like a sprinter. So quick, short, shallow, sharp breaths, because we need to get the, the air in for then the explosive movement to happen. Whereas actors and singers tend to diaphragmatically breathe. So they have to truly drop the diaphragm down, take a big breath through the front of the belly and the back of the kind of rib cage in the same way as you would brace for a big lift, right? Um, and therefore it has to be, yeah, a different way of them being able to use their abdomen. So if they're tight in an area and they can't truly get the diaphragm to drop, that can affect their breathing. If they're doing a long speech or a long singing moment, Whereas, yeah, for dancing, obviously it's, it's much quicker, it's much more rapid and the air has to go in. So yeah, you have to kind of bear those things in mind. Um, some people don't and that's okay, but it's it crosses over into the world of athleticism. It is it's all the same thing. You have to look at the difference between a power lifter and a javelin thrower or a sprinter versus a long distance runner. It is it's similar, but just they are doing different forms of art. That's the only difference. How is it mentally preparing them? Because you obviously mentioned obviously like and you knew said before we came on air and we can go into this in terms of your goals to, to eradicate like eating disorders in, in these in these things how was the mental side of it like going back to sort of that difference in terms of the actor often being in the foreground and the the dancer sort of being in the background do you find that that pressure that an actor has when they get a role because they have to be in shape for x is a bigger positive a bigger hindrance or do you feel like Sometimes the dancers have more struggle because they, they do all this, they kill themselves to look a certain way and maybe not get the same level of recognition they may deserve. Oh, that's tough. I think there's the same amount of weight in both areas. Um, the lead actor versus the ensemble dancer or ensemble actor, actress. Because there's 10, if you're in the ensemble, there's 10 other girls or boys that could take your job. So the pressure to be perfect for that role is huge. But the same pressure applies when you're the one person that's landed that lead in the front. So I think the weight is equal. It's just that there are two sides of the spectrum as to how disposable you are in that moment within that production that you're in. But the mindset it takes to go there, I find that um, training actors and actresses, because I, I train a lot of actors and actresses as we, we spoke about off air, um, and I train a lot of ordinary people too, as in mums, dads, you know, people just out of college, people that aren't necessarily in the performance or athletic world on top of that. It's a very different mindset. I, I put it a lot closer to what I would call an athletic mindset in the sense of they have a timeline. So they have a role or a filming or a, a casting that they have to be ready for and they have to look a certain way. Then they have to get to that point and they have to hold it for the duration of that filming or the show run or whatever it is. So for example, a couple of the boys I, I worked with for The Witcher, there's a couple of prominent guys in that show for series two that I shredded up. I got them ready, ready to film. And it's a very daunting show because the men, because they were both boys, the men in that show are renowned for being incredibly in shape. Um, with the lead being Henry Cavill, who is Superman that sets the precedence. And it's like, well, if you're standing next to him with your shirt off, you've got to kind of be on par with Henry because he's renowned as one of the best bodies in the industry. Um, in the same way as if it was a stage show, you know, there, there are actors like that that are brought in because they, they are that. And then everybody else around them has to rise to that occasion. The difference is, like I said, with getting someone ready, for example, a photo shoot or real life, you're getting them ready for a snapshot in time, for a moment in time where they live at their best for that day and then you reverse them back to something that is much more manageable much more lifestyle based whereas for an actor and an actress in that moment we have to shred them and get them ready they have to fulfill the brief of what they look like for that role which might not necessarily be how they naturally look they might not naturally have um that physique or build to start with. You pray that hopefully they've got good genetics under there as well. And that's why they've been cast because they semi look like that role. But then you get them to that point, which is normally really quite lean. It's normally photographic lean, anything from 12 to 10% if it's a male, you know, it could be anything from 12 to 15% for a female. So slightly smaller than the average athletic female. 
But then instead of being able to reverse them as a coach and bring them up to something a little bit higher body fat wise, that's a little bit more hormonally balanced or safe, we have to hold them there for continuity. And we have to hold them there for the Witcher boys. I had to hold them there for nearly nine months, making sure that they were stable, that they were okay, that their hormones were good, that I was still getting to increase their food and bringing them up to a healthy level when it came to being out of a deficit, for example, because we did diet them down but then making sure that their wasted change, that their, you know, their, asset, their, their actual athletic look only got better because you didn't know if there was going to be another shirtless scene thrown in. You could think you filmed your top one topless scene and then all of a sudden, three weeks later, they've decided to change the scene and pencil another one in. So it becomes quite tricky to navigate, but it takes a real focused, dialed in mindset of the actor or actress knowing that it's okay because I'm doing it for this work and in this moment in time. And it becomes a little bit method. They kind of have to live and breathe it every day. And it becomes almost cycle routine because they don't do anything outside of the show. So, you know, they eat, sleep, train, film. And that's just the way it has to be for that moment in time until they finish filming and they wrap and it becomes what is the, technically their off season. And they kind of relax a little bit and then you can do some work on the foundations from there so it's very different it's much harder but it's really satisfying but then like I said trying to then eradicate the bad behaviors that you see happen in performance so under eating we all hear about things in the media like how this star went on this cayenne juice cleanse to lose x amount for this role and it's like because they have to lose it fast and that is okay if you're surrounded by Hollywood doctors and people that are chefs and prepared to intravenously feed you whatever nutrition you need if you're going to a really uncomfortable place but you know if you're an up-and-coming actor or you're an actor in a role but you're not superman yet you still have to do that yourself and so it's it's making sure you've got the right people around you giving you the right advice that are making sure that you're healthy that are making sure that you're fueling your workouts fueling your day fueling your 12 hours on set and fueling yourself for that or or being in the theater right trying to get through eight shows a week if you under eat, you're going to then send your body into breakdown. You're going to build up negative effects, inflammation, bad responses in the body. And the body will eventually, as mine did, say enough. Like you'll either get sick or you're in, you'll injure yourself. Um, and you just won't look your best. You won't do your best work. So, yeah, if, if I can kind of bring that back and kind of a, stop the pressure of casting directors and other people that are higher than the actor being like, I need you to do this in this amount of time for them to have someone to be able to say, hey, hang on a minute, I can do that, but three weeks isn't realistic. You know, I can get the job done in six, eight, 12, 16, and then we can hold it from there. But I think, you know, there's never really been a voice or any support that says no before because actors and actresses, we love it. And we say, you know, you tell us to jump and we say how high and how quick can we get there? Because we're, we're all just eager to, to please. Oh, oh, you never know which role is going to be your big role. And all of a sudden you'll, you'll compromise, maybe not yeah. your morals, but maybe your health to, to land a part in The Witcher, for example, or, you know, whatever role in this. Like, how do you find, like, I mean, talk, you talked about your opportunity, you get in there, and obviously, you know, you obviously with a photo shoot client, you get in there and say it's that snapshot, and we can talk about the aftermath yeah. of that. But, like, how do you approach, like, keeping somebody healthy, performing well, building calories up without letting them get a bit too soft for a period of of nine months like what sort of things are you looking at what sort of thing what data are you collecting just to make sure that people are in a good place the data is similar to how you would i guess diet down any client for a photo shoot initially so i'm taking obviously keeping track of their daily weight i'm keeping track of what i call their health markers so their sleep their digestion um their hunger levels if it's female their cycle um, their adherence to what I'm setting them. That could be a big indication that things are going wrong if the person is struggling to adhere to what I'm setting, making sure that they're having enough rest days within their programming. Um, is my programming smart? So I'm getting, you know, the volume that I need for them um, within their training to create adaptation um, and the frequency, but I'm not absolutely killing them off that they can't do anything else. So I think you have to kind of look at a very overall view of what they're about to go through to make sure that they are energized. When I diet people anyway, regardless of whether you're an actor, an actress or a real person, a muggle, um, 
we look at food habits initially. So I'm a big believer in that there's no good or bad food. There is just nutrition that's more optimal. And then 20% that makes us human, a glass of wine, a brownie, whatever that is. And I, so I try not to eliminate anything. So therefore, when I'm dieting someone for a specific role, apart from probably the last four to six weeks, when we dial it in a lot, especially if they've got to go to quite a lean place, the rest is a little bit flexible. It's just that they're adhering to my macros, my calories, and they're learning about what nutrition works for them, what foods make them feel well when they digest them, what foods don't. And we talk about that. So that therefore, by the time we reach that pinnacle at the bottom, they're in just a very healthy routine of, okay, pre-workout pre carbs work best for me an hour and a half before. Actually, I do need some post-training carbs. Actually, before I go on set to do a night shoot, I'm better to have some proteins and fats. And then I'm actually better to intermittent fast for a while. Or So you start to build a relationship about like how that person functions and how they feel. And you have to, you have to, you know, physically communicate it's not just always about data it's about physically talking to that person as a coach jumping on a call chatting through it kind of how it felt because sometimes you can do a night shoot with them and you think you've set them up well and all of a sudden they're like I felt awful and you're like oh god okay so let's let's re-engineer this back where did the day start and how did it go and so it's a, it's a bit of an ebb and a flow the whole time um, but as a coach you just have to listen you have to listen to the data they're giving you and decipher it so once I've dieted them down, looking at health markers as well as, you know, um, weight and measurements and pictures, once I get them to that point, it, you know, the scales are only there then to just give me an idea of kind of where I'm navigating them to next in the sense of we all know if we eat more, the scale is going to fluctuate. The scale is just one reference of a long line of metrics that we use. It jumps around. It isn't actually the truest form of metric. It's going to be more likely their circumferences, their look, how they feel. So from there, um, I would probably normally bring the food up a little bit quicker if it was someone else. But with my actors and my actresses, I have to bring it up really slowly. So we have to reverse diet almost, but making sure minimal body fat goes on. But they are getting enough nutrition as we go. So initially, I'll be putting carbohydrates, more carbohydrates in around their their um, around their training so that I know that they are utilizing the extra fuel I'm giving them for the purpose of that function, which is why they're most insulin sensitive to make them obviously therefore utilize those carbohydrates in the best way possible. Um, and then looking at like their fat loading days or their low, low kind of carb days, if I decide to carb cycle them maybe, because maybe that's what fits in with the canteen that's on the the stage that maybe they can only get hold of fish and vegetables that day and that's that's like okay that's great but what else am I going to put around that so you kind of just have to play it by ear take your time get them to take their time with you because they're going to be hungry at that point and then bring their food up to the point of where they're not hungry anymore where they're at a good level but their circumferences haven't changed too much 0.5 one centimeter max and then hold them there and you're hoping that their food is at a good maintenance level that they can just kind of then function sometimes naturally depending on the person's physique i found that like especially for a couple of the boys especially the boys in the witch because they're big guys with a lot of lean tissue we got them to a good maintenance level their bodies weren't changing perfect continuity was bang on but then they start to lose weight again because all of a sudden their body had caught up they were still lifting well so therefore they'd gained some more lean tissue so then i got to bring the calories up again so actually a couple of the boys even now a year later they're actually only at like 12% body fat because we, we reversed them so slowly and they gained so much lean mass in that time that they're now on like 3,000, 3,900 calories and they still look the same just because we just had to take it so slow. Um, but they were super adherent and that was the thing because they had the gravitas of that role there. They weren't not going to be adherent. They weren't going to all of a sudden ring me from McDonald's at three in the morning um, unless I told them to go <laughs> um, because the weight of that job meant so much in that moment and that was what they were the doing before difference between training somebody like that for a role like obviously it comes with its own challenges like you just said it's very difficult yeah. in other ways but do you think it's almost it's almost easier to work around those things knowing that that person because of that role because it's their life as we spoke before they're going to be resourceful they're going to be a dealer if they don't know how to do something they're going to work out to do it and you know i've given this and this it's happened with this rather than often when you see with like the general population if you want to call that but you know like the muggles let's use your term that they <laughs> they will like you, you never you're always in a state of is this what you're actually doing 
like because it doesn't make sense and like yeah how do you like because that's obviously i think it's the biggest difference between someone coming in seeing christian bale transformation on social media assuming they want that it's like can they put in the same level of work like how do you approach things differently with with your with your muggles and like how do you approach it when someone sees your actors and maybe comes to you looking for that i think obviously the, like we all, we talked about the actors come in with the gravitas of the show keeping them accountable so they already have a massive why and a massive accountability to adhere to so therefore the likelihood of them veering off the plan is much less because the weight of that why is huge and you'll hear a lot of us, us coaches talk about what is your why what are you doing this for but I have a very frank conversation with my muggles when they come in to work with me I talk to them about why they want this why is it so important for them to look like Christian Bale in that photograph what is what has been that moment that has made them jump on that call with me and then from there finding out their why and finding out how weighty that why is, but then also making them understand that for Christian Bale to look that way in that photograph in that one moment in time is a snapshot of what his physique truly looks like. And actually maintenance, maintenance isn't one number, maintenance isn't one look, maintenance is kind of an ever moving evolution of an ebb and a flow, like slightly leaner, slightly softer, depending if it's summer, Christmas. Like it's about talking to them about, okay, well, you can look like that. We can get you there. You will look like that for a moment in time. Especially a lot of my clients end up wanting to do photo shoots because they've seen other clients do photo shoots. And that then also makes their why even weightier because they've also got a physical manifestation of celebrating that, that body transformation at the end. Building good habits in the meantime, I can't just sit, stick them on a meal plan. I can't just be like, right, you know, dad of two wants to look like Christian Bale. I'm going to just give him a meal plan this is his training, this is it. No, that's not going to work. What happens if their kid's up at three in the morning? What happens if they've got a night shift because they're a policeman, for example? What happens if, you know, they can't get their training in one day because I've set them a, a training spit that's five days a week? Like, so I think you have to do some smart programming looking at a true person's timeline. How much, you know, downtime can someone do? How much output can someone get into the week? Um, how, how adherent do I think I can get them to a diet plan that allows them to have a bit of life whilst getting that body? And then to being frank with them and telling them, once you get that body, this body's for a moment in time. Most athletes, most, most cover models, most actors and actresses don't live there all year round. They just don't. It's great to go there. It's great to celebrate it. It's great to see it. But actually, what is going to be the real version of this body that is then livable, that allows you to go for date night with your wife on a date? to take your kids to the park. What does that look like? And I think you have to, as a coach, build the framework and the understanding around how important it is that lean isn't always best. Lean is great. We're gonna build the house right back down to its foundation. We're gonna strip it and then we're gonna build it back up again. And then we're gonna bring it to either a place where maybe they want to learn how to bulk and gain some more size because they've realized they don't have as much lean tissue as they want. Or we're gonna bring it up to a happy maintenance where they start to understand and then reintegrate all of the good habits and the principles we've laid down whilst dieting, but now their 80, 20 balance becomes a lot broader, but they've got a much bigger understanding of what that does if they go out all weekend and just completely hit the fuck it button. They know how to dial it back and there's no fear. So I think for me, like, I kind of talked around answering your question, but I think as long as you're educating that person as you go and they are involved in the process every step of the way, and you're not just, handing out a cookie cutter meal plan saying get on with it you're not working hard enough that person will get that amazing Christian Bell transformation but they will also understand that that isn't the end of the goal that the goal then just carries on and actually the real goal is keeping the new athletic version of that body with real life and then what does that look like for them from there do you, do you find like so obviously you know both of our foundations working where we did um yeah one to one and Moving on to a primarily online space, and you mentioned communication being such a key aspect mm -hmm. of this. Do you find, obviously with your actors, they have this weight of the world on their shoulders. They're going to communicate. They're going to embrace themselves yeah. in the coaching process. Do you find that it's, it's more challenging or what tactics to use for somebody who maybe isn't as clear on, on their why or 
hits the fuck it button and all of a sudden wants to sort of go, oh, I'm just going to hide from Leanne for a period of time. Like how, because you know, I, I, I'll, I'll hold my hand up. That's the most difficult thing moving from one-to-one to a more of an online space. It's like the people that sort of hide away in the shadows rather than actually like seeking out and asking a question you need. Like how would you approach that with these people who like, yeah, say they hide away and they maybe not, they don't ask, they don't, they don't come to you with those questions you'd help out. Yeah, I think as a coach, in those moments, I think coming from the one-to-one world that me and you did, um, personal training is personal. That's why it's called the personal training. Aesthetics is is also personal within the personal training world, and it's specific. Um, you you learn to navigate personalities. You learn to you know get people results on the floor, but they they're a dear except to see you. They have to look at you in the eye and be like, I messed up this week. Whereas online it's a lot harder. So you have to build a platform in place for the client to be able to reach out to you. Yes, you have to be diligent with your time as a coach. You have to be smart. You can't always be there 24 seven as much as we try to be. But I have a very open door policy with my clients. I say it to them from the beginning. They may, they may not always listen. I have some clients that are more active with me than others. But I always say like, I'm never going to judge. I'm never going to criticize. I'm never going to get mad. And I'm never going to blame but I am going to help you figure out, work through it and move forwards. So I normally would expect them. Most of them do. I'm quite lucky that most of them feel very comfortable telling me when things have gone wrong. They will either message me, um, send me a video within the messenger system of the app that we use right on my Facebook group that they need a call with me. I would rather jump on a call and spend five minutes with somebody and truly and truly reflect on what happened. So, because they know that there's no judgment. And I think for coaches, it's really important not to judge in that moment because we can get frustrated. We want them to get the result as much as they want to get the result. And we can be all guilty. I know I've done it of that. Oh, for crying out loud, are you serious? Like you're literally a month away and you went and did that, you're an idiot. Like, but at the same time, it's their goal. It's not my goal. My goal is to get them their goal. And so we forget that in that moment, we're so invested. So I always try and, like I said, really, really drill into my clients that there's never going to be any judgment. There is just going to be us working back through that moment in time. Why did it accumulate to that moment? Was it that the diet was too aggressive in that moment? Was it that there was external factors of stress that we didn't foresee happening? And then they didn't tell me so that then as a coach, I couldn't help them. And then it, you know, accumulated to the big bang moment. Um, Is it something as a coach I could have prevented? Is it not? Is it something that then we have to reverse back through and then put different habits into place? Is it, is it just one of those things in that moment? It just happened. They had an emotional moment. We, food is also an emotional, an experience, a celebratory, something that we socialize over. And in that moment, sometimes we just don't want to miss out. And as you know, all of the programming and all of the foresight in the world sometimes cannot stop us in that moment in time. So I think just having a bit of an open door policy, I always tell my clients to let me know, I'll always jump on a call where I can and talk back through it and see if then, okay, let's put, you know, put a stop there. We don't need to then chase undoing it. Like we don't want to create this, you know, this habit of you then trying to undo what you did the week before. We move forward, we get back to the simple habits, we get back into the daily routine, we get back into sleeping well, we get back into fueling our bodies well, and we just move forward, it happened. What did we learn from it? What was it in that moment that we learned? Um, Sometimes if a client goes a little bit MIA, because I do check-ins every single week with all of my clients, so they send me pictures, they send me measurements, they send me a client log that is up to date, along with all of the information I have within the app that we use, which is really great. It's got some really smart stuff in there um tracking you know exercise output tracking progressive overload when they're queuing in the numbers it's, it's very cool but if i can see boxes aren't being ticked if i can see that their log is half empty and it used to be full if i can see that they used to you know drop me a message once a week and all of a sudden that message has disappeared um if i can see a message saying hey i'm not gonna be able to make check-in this week all of those for me as a coach start to put alarm bells in in my head And they might be fine. They might just be truly busy. But as a coach, I'm like, cool, what is going on with them right now? What is different that wasn't different before? And then it is my job to reach out to them. It's my job to be like, come to me, come and chat to me. 
let's chat through what's going on even if it's just a catch up and they're like everything is fine it's just been super stressful at work I just physically haven't had the time to input the data or to do this or to do that um and to try and bring them back to the realization of why they started this in the first place because diet fatigue does set in um life fatigue diet fatigue it all becomes one especially if someone's on a very long journey like I've got some clients that have lost six stone seven stone eight stone and they're on a long-term journey it gets tiring and so sometimes they do go missing because in that moment they've just they're just truly tired and exhausted with the process a little bit. So what is it that I can do as a coach then to bring them back in, to re-excite them about their why, to help them reflect on how far they've come, but how far they still want to go and to remember that their health is the reason they started this or their wife or their, their wedding or whatever it is. And yeah, it, it is tough. It's, it's not going to be easy and you're not going to bring everybody back. I think the hardest thing for me as a coach is the moment I realized I'm not going to be able to save everybody, I'm not going to be able to help everybody. I can only help as many people that are receptive to me helping them as possible. And I can, I can normally get 90% of them back, but there's always going to be the sum that it, the journey just runs out for them. And that is okay. You haven't failed them as a coach. You hope that they've learned enough on that part of the journey to then walk away and deal with their own life. And you hope that they come back to you when they're ready. And that's what, that's all you can do. I think, I think that's, that's key there. And I'm, I'm with you. This probably the hardest thing I've had to deal with. And I've, I've dealt with it. You, you go through it time, time again, like a cycle in, in my career where you like, especially when you got to see someone that you either really want to help or you know the potential they have. And, yeah. you know, oh, when you see someone's genetic potential, we get excited and I think they forget that. And it's the most frustrating, my, most frustrating thing. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and it's, yeah, I, I find that when you, when you look at those notes, people start going quiet. It's like, I, I get very frustrated because 90% of the time it's an easy fix. Very yes. rarely when someone goes quiet, is it something dramatically that needs to change? It's, I, I got to 70 kilos and I don't like the number going below the idea of going below 70 because in my head, 70 is a milestone. So um, I'm just going to self-sabotage. But if you kind of went on and go, let's explain why you'll look better at 65, you know, it, that could be a 10 minute conversation. And there's yeah. nothing more infuriating when someone won't, because they're so far of like into this sort of self-sabotage route, they'll hide away and not give you that 10 minutes. You know, you just give me that 10 minutes. This is the, yeah. the, the big stepping stone that takes you from the bit you've got to up until this point in your life to this next bit. Yes, I think, especially for my guys, actually, that rings very true with my male clients. Hmm. My, my female clients are very good about sharing their emotion and telling me when things are going wrong in their life. Um, and they don't tend to have a relationship with the scales in the same way as a guy does. I don't know if you find this. My female clients are emotionally attached to the number. Yes, yes. But okay. they always want that. They always want that number to be lower. Yes. Whereas my male clients get attached to the number, but they never want that number to go to what they deem as a feminine number. So seventeen below. Some of my my leaner, my petite guys, my the, they've still got a lot of muscle, but they're just not tall. They're five six. They're five five, and it's like the, getting their getting them to understand wrapping their head around that they're going to have to go below 70 kg, 65 kg, maybe even reach a 60 to get the look that they want and how that they'll look bigger in that moment, but they'll be the lightest they've ever been. They, they've got the, they tend to deem this number as a feminine number because maybe their girlfriend is that weight or maybe their mum was that weight or so it, it can sometimes take a minute to bring someone past that and to get them to understand that actually it is just a number. It doesn't matter whether you're male or female, like it is just a number. We're going off your look, your aesthetic. And I try and remind my clients of that a lot, that like, I'm looking at not your daily weight, I'm looking at your daily weight times seven <laughs> divided by seven, like, sorry, added by seven, divided by seven. I'm, I'm looking at your average um, to see that if I've got you on the journey that I've promised you in time, I'm looking at your waist, waist measurements, you know, has your chest grown, is your bicep increased? Has your hips shrunk? Like, are your glutes firmer? That's why I think pictures and, you know, measurements are much more important for me personally, for anybody. And trying to get them to understand that, you know, trying to detach from that weight. I did have recently a couple of female clients that I've dieted the entire time with zero scale because it was triggering their anxiety so bad. I was like, do you know what? It's going to be harder for me as a coach to miss some data but I'm not prepared to have you feel anxious on the scale for this amount of time. I want you to get used to just adhering. We're going to look at other metrics and you're still going to lose weight. 
you know, as a coach, I'm still gonna have to navigate that. And I said, and when the time is right, and when I think you're in a great headspace, I will ask you to go get on the scale for me just once, just so I know where as a coach, where you're at, where I've got to take you from there. And, you know, she, this, well, this particular client I'm thinking of outright, she had such a bad relationship with food and the scale and punishing herself and how, you know, exercise was, you know, punishment and, and food had to be restrictive if she wanted the body she wanted. And now she's like enjoying carbohydrates. She's just like, oh God, why did I ever cut these out? Um, she's loving her training. She's found like her inner power, as I call it. She's physically strong. She was like, I've never felt so strong and empowered in my training. Like it's not a punishment. It's just part of my day. And she was like, I don't even care what the scale says because I see my clothes getting smaller. And then I asked her the, other, uh, the last week, actually, I was like, like, we've been on this journey for tw nearly 20 weeks. And I was like, do you feel comfortable getting on the scale just to give me a metric so that I know that your food's in a good position, that I know if, you know, I haven't pulled the calories too much or do I need to bring them up or just to give me some data. And I was like, we don't have to if you don't feel like it. She's like, I don't even care what it says. Let's do it. And she jumped on it and she'd lost 16 kg and she was super happy. And then, you know, we've got the, the last little bit. We've set a goal. We've put the scale away. And we're carrying on. So sometimes, you know, that scale weight metric, we do sometimes as coaches, we either have to help you navigate around it. So don't be afraid to talk about it as a client. If, if you are scared about it, if you are scared about what that number reads, because we can do other things in that moment to help you. We prefer to have all the data we can because then we can do the best job we can. But yeah, it's it normally comes from yeah lack of understanding. And like you said, it's a quick fix of a conversation. Like if you're a good coach, you can think on your feet. You know what's happening. You've probably been there. Like it's just being open. It's being open to it and trying to get that client to to come to you to to talk about it and if it takes them a week life. if it takes them four weeks you'll still get them their goal they just they need to just get their mind over the matter ahead i think i think the 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 scale weight thing i think scale weight data you either got to take it every day or not at all yes i agree no with middle you. ground um, i think the worst thing sorry weight watchers but i think the worst thing you can do for having anxiety with your body weight is to take it once a week because you're oh my having God. a reminder every week. If, if it doesn't go the way you want, I saw someone the other day and I said, I had to, I, 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 she, I somehow ended up following her and she put up like, uh, what do I need to eat uh, before my way in at Slimming World? Um, I don't, I, I, I don't want to gain weight, but I can't not eat until four o'clock. And I just sent her a voice note. I'm just like, you need to either stop taking it at all or more realistically, because you're going to do your weigh-ins every week take it every single day so then if it does go up because you've eaten something you understand hey that's not fat and that once a week weigh in is the most like panic inducing thing and it's trying to say like right ideally you take it more because if you take it more you want to start fluctuations you can then go hey you know you're freaking out you gain weight Do you know this time last month you gain weight and the night, month before you gain weight and the month before you gain weight and you realize you're a 30 year old female right think it might be a little bit normal you know like and then all of a sudden, if they'd never taken that weight, they would never know about that and they'd panic. And, and I think it's the, the best situation is going absolutely cold turkey and just go, right, we're not even going to use it as a metric. Yeah, exactly. And it's hard as a coach because it's a, it's a big part of our data. When if, especially if you're a coach like us, because I know me and you specifically will use stuff like that to, tr like to create trajectory if someone's how hot we're going to bring them into a shoot or you know, how long it's going to take them to diet down. But it's not the be all and end all at the end of the day. Um, it's massive. I get all my clients to track their cycles. All of my female clients in, in their tracker, we, we mark it in, we color it pink, we track the days because it affects our bodies massively. And I don't think enough coaches do that, male or female, and make people understand, like, like you said, the correlation between, well, this time last month and look at this time last month. And actually your average weight is down. So even though it, you feel like you've plateaued, that isn't a true plateau. A true plateau is when your average weight stops moving as well. Like, you're actually fine and also your measurements have gone down which means you've lost body fat and this is a fat loss journey not a scale weight loss journey like i'm agree i'm i agree with you like things like weight watchers and stuff i think can be more harmful than good when it comes to scale weight yes i i, I think it's that it, i i i i do agree with the term it is it's it's a it's a fat loss journey not a weight loss journey however i think that can sometimes do as more as much harm as it does good because people need to understand that 99.9% .9 of people, especially if you're not taking any extra supplementation, you need to lose a considerable amount of weight. I'm going back to what we talked about before. Yeah. Girls come in going, oh, I need to lose 40 kilos. And I'm like, you need to lose five. And then guys are like, 
two kilos and I'll be shredded. I'm like, yeah, you need to lose 25. And <laughs> it, 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 universally. But I think it's the guy, you were talking about earlier on about the, the, the guy who gets stuck at a certain scale weight. It's, it's also educating people that being flat is a thing. And we look at the Hollywood, like the, the Hollywood bodies and things like this, and people that get on men's health. It's like, yeah, but like, they probably have, they have, they all had to go through a period where they looked quote unquote skinny, even though they're not skinny, they're just flat. Don't worry, we'll fill you back out again. But you need to get your head into that, but it's going to be time yeah. to look your best. No, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think you just hit the nail on the head. It's education. It's education and communication is key. And if you're not getting that from your coach, your coach is doing you a disservice. Um, because we should be empowering you to understand your journey, not hiding little secrets to hope that then you re-sign with us for six more months. You know, we should, you know, we're trying to empower you. We're trying to get you healthier. We're trying to get you to understand the process. Of course, then we want you to stay with us for the long term because we like coaching you if we've been with you for six months we like you as humans we know a lot we probably know more about you than your family because we talk about your highs your lows your wins but um yeah all about it all of it is about education and communication and trying to get the person to understand what is truly happening in their body in, at that moment in time and if you can do that 90 percent of the time they'll be like oh, oh okay this is okay i trust you let's move forwards hmm. is, um so as we mentioned early on about getting people in shape for roles where their, their, their mm -hmm. job almost is to eat, sleep, train, repeat. Yes. How do you approach people where they're, they want those bodies, they, may, they want to do all this stuff for the body, but they absolutely refuse because they put every, not refuse themselves, but they put everyone else before themselves, the job, the family, the kids, everything, that they never ever allow themselves time for themselves. Because sometimes I feel that that's quite a hard battle as a coach because they've never put themselves first. So they don't know how to even start doing it. And they're just in the head. It's like, no, I don't have the time. When you break it down, you're just not giving yourself the time. How do you, how do you start to educate those clients, especially when they want the bodies that you've shown on your Instagram that require them? Yeah. I mean, initially, obviously, if they're coming in with a big goal, like some of my shredded Instagram clients or my actor clients, um, I have to educate them that in that moment, it takes a little bit of selfishness. It takes a little bit of time for you. And if you've never done that before, it's gonna feel strange and it's gonna feel foreign. And you're gonna tell me that you don't have enough time, but trust me, there is always time. Whether that means we sit down with your daily diary and we reverse engineer your week out. And so we, we put in your non-negotiables first. Trying to educate them as to how to create time out of what seems like chaos and no time. Um, it doesn't always go perfectly in the beginning. It takes a moment. It takes a bit of teething. It takes a lot of support. Um, it takes them to trust you for you to say, hey, like, I know that you can do bet this better. Let's have a look at what's going on this week. Like, where did we fall short on timings? Was it, you know, an unforeseen moment like the child being sick? Or was it not an unforeseen moment? Was it you just letting everything else rule your week, your, rule your day? Um, and trying to almost help them quiet the chaos so that they have a structure and a routine and actually then your coaching becomes their grounding so that then the chaos happens around it so they all they know need from you in that moment is they need to know what they've got to hit what box i call it boxes to tick what they've they got to tick that day what have they got to knock off so it's almost the big decisions that they're doing with you are not even big decisions anymore they are just habits and choices um, our brain can only compute five major decision, decisions a day as a human. Like we can only knock off five major decisions before we spiral out. Um, it's why a lot of the, you know, the big CEOs of the world that like that run these billion dollar companies concentrate on one major decision a week. Like they wear the same clothes every day. You know, they have someone else cook for them. It's because they have to concentrate on those true fundamental things. So in that moment as a coach, we have to then almost make what we are doing with them a non-decision. It is just something that's gonna happen, it's a function. It's something that they just need to do to tick off to move them forwards. And then let worrying about, you know, picking the kids up from school, um, going to see your sick grandma, whatever that is, be the big life decisions, the big interview at work, so that then they can truly function even better outside of it and actually help them create time, help them to understand that downtime is important. Um, downtime just doesn't have to be chaos. Like 
okay, you've got steps to get in, great. Can you take the kids to the park and do it at the same time? Like, is there a way that we can then blend this into a lifestyle that you can maintain that then becomes less like you're, you know, chasing a goal I've set for you, but we're integrating it into something that is much more attainable. So I think for me, that's kind of how I go about it. And in the beginning, it might take them a little bit longer to get off the starting blocks because it takes as a coach diving in and kind of kind of messing with their day a little bit in the true sense of being like, cool. So what, when do you normally have meetings? What time do you get up? Could you get up an hour earlier? Could you go an hour early to bed? Who's picking the kids up from school? Like you have to kind of dive into those things to be like, cool. So could you train here? What works for you? How do you feel there? Like, could we grab this in, you know? Oh, so you haven't had time to meal prep. Could we use a meal prep company or is there a pret manger near you or so whatever you're doing to then eventually eliminate that stress from their week so that then you are not the stressor. You are just something that keeps them running along and you become their foundation. Yeah, yeah I, 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 think, I think that's, that's you know, his finding ways to sort of like integrating it into their life. But I think the key thing is making them aware that they need to make time for this, I think. And I think that's the big yeah. thing you mentioned because like a lot of times that's often the hardest thing. Like you, you see people at different stage of this, but I've, you know, I've got a couple of clients that you know, 20, 30, 40 years into never putting themselves first and it's it's every week it's like you know this is this will this will happen so quickly when you truly put yourself first and you see it and these are i tend those those kind of people and i i, I go out so you know i think it's not too bold a claim they will often coincide with the people who say i'm only on 1100 calories and i can't lose weight yeah oh my god always always, always. they're always on a diet they've been on a diet their whole life yeah like and, yeah well, and it's always the people that also say i couldn't get to the gym this week because i have to do the school run or my boss added another meeting in my diary and i'm like well if you if you have this little attention to detail in this part of your life what makes me think that your food tracking has the same level of attention to detail that your actual 1100 calories yes exactly yeah there are also people that stop tracking as soon as something doesn't go right always always yeah. MIA I and I always know because I'll go on to do their their check-in and all of a sudden I've got three days worth of data missing and I'll be like cool so we need to talk about what happened before this happened yeah so where did the snowball happen what happened in your week that all brought back the bad habit I say bad habits the destructive habits that you were stuck in before that we were trying to undo to move you forwards I think it's also a guilt thing as well they have this you know, people stuck in that mode have this guilt thing for wanting to put themselves first, that it's almost embarrassing and shameful to want to be better, to want to create time for themselves. Um, that they've been lost in this kind of caregiver role or CEO role or whatever role it is that creates them to just get lost in that moment for so long that they actually, they don't, like you said, they don't know how to get out of it. They don't know how to step off, like, the kind of moving train I suppose and kind of it's like, take a step back. Sorry to cut you off there, but I suppose That's it's right. almost like you having uh, performing and dancing as your identity. The difference yeah. is you have to be, and putting aside maybe going too far the other way, you have to be healthy or in shape and mobile and trained to do that job, whereas their identity involves them sitting behind a desk so they don't know how to do anything else. Yeah. And it, I also sometimes think it depends on how sporty they were growing up as well. Like, I always think that coincides a little bit. Like, were they from an athletic household? Did they do team sports? Um, there's a lot to be said for growing up doing team sports and group events and things, because it gives you that kind of skill level of drive, support, knowing how to work towards a goal, um, being able to get good at a skill and a practice and a timeline. I always think that people that have come into me that were quite active when they were kids and did a lot um, are better at then, you know, kind of battling things as adults. Whereas I find that people that were not quite that way inclined as kids, maybe, you know, were a little bit shyer, didn't want to join in, um, you know, went straight into working very young and have been stuck in a corporate field for quite a long time they don't really know their identity. So like you said, their identity is everything around them because they've, ne they've never worked through those kind of challenges and goals that kind of sports and team events and athleticism naturally puts into your life from a young age when you, when you do it. And that's not a bad thing. I'm not saying that everybody, you know, has to be 
you know, captain of the cheerleading squad. Like it doesn't really, it's not about that, but I think there's just a real foundation for, you know, getting involved as a kid, getting them active, getting them out there, getting them off the computer games. Like it creates a real kind of structure to having to turn up to that sporting event, to having to work towards that goal, learning what winning and losing feels like. Um, all of those functions that set us up actually really well as adults that we we take for granted as kids. Yeah, it's resourcefulness as well, I think. I think I, I, what I've learned a lot here because there's a lot of this here in terms of, and I'm not saying this to say a good or bad thing, there's huge benefits, certainly in terms of people's bank balance, but a lot of things here, it's a, you know, a lot of Chinese families who push their kids into, you know, they finish school, they have three tutoring sessions before they're allowed to go to bed, then they've got the homework. And a lot of these people are, are, are very sedentary by nature. And it's amazing the people, as you say, who are, have sporty active backgrounds, you know, you set them a goal of eight, nine, 10,000 steps, they will get it. And it, it, it's yeah. not, it's, it's just, it is what it is. It's not an inconvenience. And it's amazing that people will say, I've never, ever, ever had someone say, that step counts tough to hit, who doesn't then exaggerate how long it would take them to hit those round steps. I once gave someone <laughs> a step target and go, oh, so 10,000 steps you know, a day. Oh, but that's like 17 hours of walking. I'm like, it really, really isn't. It's like three, you know, like, and, and like, they always over-exaggerate. And, and I, you, I've learned, I've mad, I remember this, like I learned a lot about people, the difference between people that get activity targets and stay lean without thinking about it and people that don't by watching a taxi queue here in hong kong so you know there's a lot of places where there's loads of taxis around there's taxis everywhere and these people will be in the taxis and they will drive around the corner and they will come down towards the taxi right? and there'll be a long line of taxis and you'll notice people that they you know that i'm not i'm not gonna say that they're over it's not always but you know there's people that you can tell these are the people that would would find a step count hard to hit where the taxi's gone. There's a taxi 10 seconds further walk down, but they wait for the taxi to pull up straight to their foot. So they have to just wait, take one step to jump in the door. And it's like, you're making it like, the, oftentimes it's like, when I do a step goal, I was like, right, do you take an escalator? Or do you walk up the stairs? Do you take 10 minute walking breaks? And I, I, I it's, Part of this identity where I, I, I sometimes I'm amazed how people think the world is going to end if they take 10 minutes away from their laptop. Oh my goodness. And they forget that actually, if they did, they'd be more productive the moment they go back to it. Uh, exactly. Now, I, I like the, um, the Stan Efferding approach of doing like 10 minute or 10 minute walk every hour. And I was like, yeah. when you break it down, it's like, to your step goal, all it has to be is like, if you can't take away a moment away from your office, if you've got an email app on your phone, Yes. Okay. And see emails was walking around with it. Yeah. Or take a call. I've, you know, I've had people take calls before pacing back and forth. I'm like, you know, is this a call that has to be face to face or is it an over the phone call? And if it's an over the phone call, pacing and thinking are linked. Like there's something to do with the rhythm of walking and the pattern of your brain. It's why people, we go for a jog because it makes us think clearer or it's why we go for a walk to clear our heads. Like there is obviously a linked pattern between rhythm and brain rhythm. So actually, you're much more productive on that call if you're, first of all, wandering around because your thought processes are becoming clearer because you're taking away other tasks and you're truly focusing on listening and responding. But at the same time, you're then act, being active and moving and being nice to your body in that moment. And all you're doing is getting work done, on, like you said, emailing or taking the physical call and just going for a walk. But you're also going to feel better at the end of it. And then you're going to be more productive in, in your work, in your skills. Um, it's just in your life in general, I think. Mm. So I, I, I know that you, you know, you're, you're getting close to this, this 90 minute time frame that we had. So if we were going to like, really? like, if we were going to sort of sum up, if you were saying like, if someone came to you as a, like a general population client and whether this mm -hmm. is physical or mental, if you were going to give them a, like, let's say three key tips that was going to get them the Hollywood body was close to it as possible. What would, what would you think it would be? Oh my goodness three key tips to get them their Hollywood body. Initially, I would say get more color on your plate. So my biggest rule is I want, you know, I want to see a colorful plate. I want to see a beautiful plate. I want to see, it, I want to see it full of healthy, beautiful produce, you know, vegetables, fish, 
obviously, yes, we have to be in a calorie deficit. So I would say my get get color on the plate. If your food is beige, you're not doing yourself, you know, a good service. Get active, get out there and do things that you enjoy. Get moving initially. So if, if that's strength training, if that's going for a jog, if that's going to a Zumba class, whatever that is, get active, find something you enjoy and stick to it. And then the third would be patience. If you've got a goal, it is not going to happen overnight. So chopping and changing diet every five minutes is not going to help you. Create a plan, stick to it for long enough, be in a calorie deficit, the weight will come off. I, so I really like I really like that last one. I think the result, results are built in the mundane. Before we look mm -hmm. at the, and I've got a post ready to go from this, which is as my, my Instagram refuses to let me post captions at the moment. I'm, just, <laughs> I'm actually going to become a quote post. My quote, it's going to be like Twitter. Um, but it's like, before you look at the paleo cookies or the keto diet or the fancy training split or the, the you know, the him bean, it's like, how about we, we do something that's not the sexy stuff for long enough to get those results? Agreed. And, a diet is consistency, not perfection. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think it's the, and that, that's a big one when it comes to mental side of things as well, is that, that people expect perfection of themselves when they're either on or they're off. Um, and I think for me, it's, it's if I was going to add my three to that list, I think most of them yeah. probably wouldn't be actually nutrition and training. It would be take ownership of it, because a lot of people don't. They, you know, I hear things like, when I hear the word sustainable on a diet, it's not I don't want the diet to be sustainable, but if I hear on day one that someone that doesn't want to take ownership of the bad habits they have and wants to try and just keep them all, but the bad habits cause them to be the unhappy weight that they're in now. So taking, so like taking ownership, getting a detective mindset, so being resourceful. Like mm -hmm. I think when you do that, that, that encompasses the fear of failure because it's like rather than, oh, it's not worked, well, I might as well order dominoes. It's right, what went well, what didn't, what could I do better? Like having that detective mindset and trying to work it out, I think is 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 all is, is is so important. And I'd probably say food volume, which kind of goes into your one, but like people make diets harder by trying to curb cravings. Every ridiculous, single yeah. Just eat loads of green. Like the the volume of green in your stomach versus the volume of a small beige plate, you're gonna be fuller for longer. Like you curb your craving feel better by filling yourself up you ever will by having a little bit of it in the diet and i'm not saying you can't have both no so, like, i agree you're gonna have one of the two bulk it bulk it out every single day of the week always always i say to my clients a lot like you are the author of your own book you get to write this story so if you're playing the victim right now you've written it that way mm. so if you want to be the heroine in your in your own story you better get writing it like it is for uh, you to put it on the page. So for, it's for you to get it there. So only you can do this. I like that. And I, it's, 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 it's very similar in a way to the, so when I uh, interviewed Andrew Coates, um, who, who's, I uh, don't, do you follow Andrew? Yes, I do. Yeah. yeah, yeah Cause everyone, everyone is, everyone here listening to this, either they're a coach or not, probably seen someone share one of these posts, um, yeah. which is now going to be my Instagram. Now I've got a shadow ban. Um, but like <laughs> he said that as well, like your, if, 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 his, if coaching was a Harry Potter book, the client is Harry, we are Dumbledore. If it's Lord of the Rings, you know, we are Gandalf, they are Frodo. And it's like, we're there to be the guide, not to be the hero. But they have to step up and be that hero. Like, yeah. They have to. You have to be ready to take ownership for it. And it's okay if you're not ready. The, this Programs like ours will still be there. Coaches like us will still be there ready to help you. But you have to decide that it's time. And you, only you can make the change to start. The hardest part is normally walking through the door of the gym, ringing the coach for consultation call, planning your first diet for yourself if you're going it alone. Like that's the hardest step. You've already done the hard work. Now you just got to do it. Now you just got to, like you said, do the mundane, do it day in, day out and refuse to let, refuse to let it beat you. Like refuse yeah. to let your health not be a priority. If we're going to add a bonus one that sort of goes on from that, I would say definitely open communication that we spoke about quite a lot in this episode. But mm -hmm. it's, I would much rather, we talked earlier on about how we get excited, we see genetic potential of somebody and we want them to do well. I would much rather, oh, 10 times would much rather someone say to me, Simon, life's getting a bit tough at the moment. Can we pull to maintenance calories, put the diet on hold? Dan, I haven't hit my diet this week because life's got busy. I don't want to admit it. So I'm now going to not answer messages. I'm not going to do a check-in. I'm going to hide away. I'd much rather go, can we just bring calories up? I'd be like, yeah, fine. Yeah, no worries. Like, you know, like. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I think 
for any clients listening to this, if you can't have an open flow of dialogue with your coach, they're not the right coach for you. But don't be afraid to ask moments like that. Sometimes a coach will say no because of X, Y, Z. And sometimes they'll be like, absolutely, with everything that you've just explained that's going on in my life right now, bringing you up to maintenance, all it will do is put a couple of weeks onto the end of your diet journey. At the end of it, you will still get the body of your dreams. Who cares if you get shredded in six, 12 or 16 weeks, or if it takes you six months or a whole year, you're still going to get there. And that is the whole point. Because you're at a crossroads here. The people <clears throat> hide away will go, they hit that bracket, they go back to where they started. They hit that bracket, they go back to where they started. And then the yo-yo diet and go back to things like getting rid of the, the emotional connection to eating. If you go, I hit that bracket, I pull out for four weeks, smart, and I go back in, we now all of a sudden have some, we've now put these two ends sort of like together. Yeah. But we'll do a, in a way, a caveat to what you said though, in the sense of, if you can't have an open dialogue as a coach, they're not the right coach. I think if clients listen to this, that may be true. But you're doing yourself a disservice if you don't try to have that open relation first. Because I know, because we've said it in this episode, and I get it, you get it, we get people that will ghost us halfway through a coaching program midway through. We would have happily had that conversation with them. Where, yes. So they may have felt that they couldn't, but rather than going, speaking about it and finding out why and what could we do to change our approach, they just hide away in the shadows. So they might be the right coach, but you've got to give them the chance. Yes. Yeah, you have to try first. Mm. If you've tried and failed, then you know it's not the right fit and that's okay. But yeah. um, don't ever be afraid to ask. If you don't ask, you don't get. Yeah, we, and we, if we, Yeah, if we want help, we have to ask for help. In the same way as a coach, if we want help, we have to ask for help. Like it, it, it is the way it is. If, 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 I, if I was gonna leave this episode sort of like one thing on, on that topic, and I put up a post of this recently, it's like if personal training clients asked questions when they needed help, results would be almost 100% across the board, regardless of the experience and the skill of the coach, because they would find okay. ways of dealing with it. And I yeah. think that's why some of the best coaches are always the smartest coaches. They just have either gotten good with the clients they've got that are willing to have that communication with them, or have good enough people skills that they'll find solutions, even if they don't know why their solution worked. Yeah, I agree. I absolutely agree. And I think that is why I'm very lucky a lot of my clients do so well mm. I would say the biggest percentage of my clients do really well is I'm willing to find you a solution I'm willing to listen I'm willing to talk um I'm willing to put it into perspective of my own life experiences as well as yours it's why it's what makes you a good coach as well right and we're, will, we're willing to be there we're willing to be your support and to move you forwards but you've got to ask for it yeah on that, on that note then, for, for people that do want to reach out and have a conversation with you, where, what a great segue you led us into there. Where do people find you? Um, the easiest way is probably my, my Instagram at the moment. So Leanne Marshall Fitness um, on Instagram. Slide into my DMs, drop me a message. I'll get back to you and we can have a chat. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for coming on. This is really, really interesting. Really enjoyed this. Thank you so much. Take care.